In the first half, we're fighting two waves of enemies, starting with a Ruin Guard. This fight will be mostly straightforward for most players, and it's more about making sure you can output enough DPS to clear this site quickly. One thing worth mentioning is that it does have this Geo Aura, which periodically creates these Geo Waves. The damage from these waves can creep up on you unexpectedly, so do try to keep an eye out for them. If you're using Bennett on this side, which I do recommend, they usually aren't a huge problem. For the second wave, we're fighting two Cryo Lawa Trolls, and it's because of these guys that I recommend using a Pyrocentric team for this half. National variants, a Hu Tao team, or even a Mono Pyro team all work pretty well on this half. These Lava Trolls do hit very hard, especially if you get hit by both of them at the same time, so you have to use a combination of dodges and bursts to avoid their attacks carefully. One of the Lava Trolls also has a Cryo Aura that summons the Ice Cage periodically, which can also become a pretty big threat. One attack I want to call out especially is this Leaping Attack, which happens about 15 seconds after they spawn. The timing happens to work out that the Ice Cage spawns right when the Lava Trolls use this Leaping Attack, which makes it more difficult to dodge them. I actually recommend holding one of your bursts until this attack comes out so that you can safely iframe this combo. In terms of timing, you're aiming to clear this half in under 1 minute, ideally finishing close to the 9-10 mark if possible. The second half of this chamber is obviously the harder half, and it makes that fight a lot easier if you have at least 2 minutes remaining on the clock, and you'll understand why once we get there. If you are using some national variant with a well-built Xiangling, it's usually not too difficult to meet that time requirement. Raiden National gave me the fastest clear on this half, being able to finish it in just two rotations or at around the 920 mark. The most important thing is making sure your rotations are consistent and you have enough ER on Xiangling to maintain that uptime on her burst. The second half is what most of you are probably here for, and we're fighting the one and only Weenut. The first step to cracking this Weenut is to get familiar with its moveset and attack pattern, so let's go over that first. For its first attack, it'll use this thrusting attack where it shoots straight out of the ground, or this flyby attack where it shoots a bunch of Animo missiles at you. The thrusting attack is usually the easier one to deal with because it happens right where you're standing and makes it easy for you to get some initial damage in. As far as I can tell, it's completely random which one it opens with, at least based on the runs that I've done so far, so unfortunately there is already some RNG involved in this fight. For its second attack, it'll briefly breach the surface in one of the four quadrants of the arena that you're standing closest to. In my experience, these breaching attacks are usually good opportunities to get some damage in because they happen relatively close to where you are. For its third attack, it uses this charge up laser attack. And this one happens in the opposite quadrant of the arena where you're currently standing. So after its breach attack, be prepared to run immediately to the other side of the arena. For its fourth attack, it again breaches the surface, close to where you are, so this is another opportunity to get some damage in. And for its fifth and final attack, it'll enter its floating state, where it slowly circles the arena and summons these bubbles over time. If you're able to pop at least two of these bubbles using Pyro, Cryo, Hydro, or Electro damage, it'll bring the boss down and give you about a 10 second window to deal damage. After it gets up from this vulnerability phase, it repeats these five attacks one more time. I want to emphasize the importance of learning not only the order of these attacks, but also the locations of where each one happens. The first time you fight this boss, it's going to feel very frantic and random where the boss pops up. But once you learn this attack pattern and these locations, you'll be able to anticipate approximately where it'll pop up next and make this fight go a lot more smoothly. Next, if we look at the timing of these attacks, we'll find that they happen roughly 10 seconds apart from each other. And if we include the 10 second vulnerability window of its fifth attack, it means this boss has an attack cycle that follows roughly a 1 minute rotation. Since most of our damage is likely going to be dealt at the end of each of these rotations during that vulnerability window, it's really important to get at least two full minutes for this fight. There is a bit of a waiting time at the beginning of each rotation, so if we account for that overhead, two minutes and 10 seconds is kind of the golden time that we're aiming for in this half. And this is why I recommended finishing the first half with at least 9-10 remaining on the clock. Ideally, we want to take off about 50% of its HP with each of these 1 minute rotations, so if you're able to get its HP down to about half by the end of its first vulnerability window, that's a good indication that you're on pace for a 3 star clear. Knowing these timings also gives us a good idea of when we should be using our big cooldowns. 
For most teams, you'll want to use your key bursts right as the boss is going down for its vulnerability window, which is about 50 seconds into its one minute rotation. Given that most teams have a 20 second rotation, based on the cooldown of most major bursts, working backwards from this 50 second mark, that means we can also use our bursts at the 30 and 10 second marks of the boss's rotation. And these timings also happen to be right around when the boss uses those breaching attacks, which is another reason why I tend to deal most of my damage during those windows. So knowing the boss's attack timings and combining them with the cadence of our own rotations gives us a clear timeline for when we should be dealing most of our damage. Now when we talk about dealing damage at these specific windows, we need to account for the setup that's required to ramp up our damage. If we start our rotation as the boss is breaching the surface, it's already too late because by the time we get to our main damage dealer, the boss is almost back underground. Instead, we need to make sure we start our rotation about 6 or 7 seconds before we actually want to deal damage, so that when that time comes, everything is already set up and we can maximize the time we spend actually dealing damage while the boss is vulnerable. This also means that abilities that last for a long time and can deal damage well after they've been cast are really effective here. Things like Xing Chou and Yelan's Burst are both good examples of this. The next thing I want to talk about is how tanky this boss is. The Spiral Abyss version of this boss is modified from the original Overworld version and its resistances have been increased from 25% all res to 55% all res. For reference, most enemies have 10 to 15% all res and just a few bosses have about 20 to 25% all res. So 55% is an absurdly high amount. If you notice that your hyper blooms or other fixed sources of damage aren't hitting as hard as they usually do, it's not just you, the boss actually is a lot tankier than most other enemies. But what this also means is that resistance debuffs like the effects of VV and Deepwood are really valuable and basically necessary in this fight. You deal almost two times as much damage when VV is applied on the boss, so it's really important to maintain uptime on that debuff. The other place where res is relevant in this fight is during its vulnerability window. The boss loses 45% res to the element that was used to pop the bubbles during its floating state. What this means is that you want to make sure to pop the bubbles using an element that matches whatever your main source of damage is. If you're using a team that uses VV, one way to do this very naturally is to apply your primary element on the boss and then follow up with an animo attack to trigger a swirl reaction with that element. This swirl reaction is basically pulling double duty because it triggers the VV effect to decrease the res of the element that you swirled and that swirl damage is also being used to pop the bubbles so the boss's res to that element also drops by another 45%. And speaking of popping the bubbles, I found that it's usually easiest to pop them if you use a big AoE attack while the boss is kind of dipping down near the front of the arena. Most animo attacks will work here, and if you're using a Hyper Bloom team, Kuki's Burst also works very nicely to achieve this. With that, I think we've covered most of the combat-related and mechanical tips I have for this boss, so let's talk about team comps next, starting with Hyper Bloom. Hyper Bloom is always a great choice for dealing high single-target damage, of course, and a nice little bonus is that sometimes the Hyper Bloom missiles will actually follow the boss into its next attack, so it does a good job of working around these relatively short vulnerability windows. It is possible to clear with a 4-star variant of this team, but I personally found it to be very difficult. The uptime on all of your bursts and skills have to be really on point to output enough DPS, and if you mistime any of your cooldowns, you likely won't have enough Dendro Course to deal any meaningful damage. If you have Nahida, she really helps to lower the difficulty of this fight, so I would definitely prioritize putting her on this half. Because her skill lasts for so long and just deals continuous dendro damage throughout the entire fight, she really relieves the burden of having to time your attacks correctly and managing your cooldowns. Ayaka team comps also do pretty well here because her burst deals a lot of damage in a relatively short 5 to 6 second window, which is perfect for these short vulnerability windows each time the boss pops up. Obviously we won't be able to use our burst every time it comes up, but as we learned earlier in the video, its attacks have roughly a 10 second frequency, Ayaka's burst has a 20 second cooldown, so you can ideally use it every other time it pops up. You can run a standard Mona variation of this team, and a Mono Cryo variation also works quite well. Since we will be popping those bubbles with Cryo damage, that means the boss's Cryo res will be decreased during its stun phase, so piling on more Cryo damage allows us to make the most of that debuff. One important thing to note if you are using an Ayaka team here, for some reason, whenever I use Ayaka in this fight, 
The boss tends to skip its fourth attack in its rotation, which is that second breach attack. So after its laser attack, it goes straight into its floating state. What this means is that we have to shift our attack timings a little bit. Since we want to use Ayaka's burst during the stun phase of the floating state, working 20 seconds back from that, we want to use one burst during its laser attack, and then another one during its very first opening attack. So far, I've only seen it skip its fourth attack when I use Ayaka, but please do share in the comments if you observe this with any other team comps as well. One team comp that I enjoyed a lot and actually got me my fastest clear is this Yelon Taser team. The main idea with this team is just to load up our team with three of the strongest off-field single target damage dealers in the game and enable them with an Animo driver such as Sucrose. The key thing that makes this team so effective against this boss again goes back to how high its base resistances are. Taser teams do a good job of maintaining the Hydro Electro Double Aura on the enemy thanks to how Electro Charged works which makes it easy for us to trigger those double swirls and reduce both the Hydro and Electro res on this boss. Since the boss has such high base resistances, that res shred is just that much more valuable. One last team comp that can work pretty well here is a Hyper Carry Raiden team. As long as you take advantage of those three attack windows like we talked about earlier, the rotation timings line up really well with the boss's attack pattern and you end up with a pretty smooth clear. The main drawback of this team is that it takes Bennett away from the first half where you usually want that national team to be, so this would only be possible if you had another way to effectively battery Shangling or a Ku Tao team to take that first half instead. So this is a bit of a luxury option that won't be available to everyone. And that covers just about all of the team comps that I had the most success with. This boss is a very tough nut to crack, but hopefully these tips and team comp suggestions can help make the fight a little bit easier. The builds for all the characters I showed in this video will follow shortly, and as always, thank you so much for watching.